Chris Porter of Porter Financial Strategies. I'd like to welcome you to Community Conversations. This is the inaugural show. We're going to be talking about matters that are important to you. Today's topic is long-term care, and we're happy to have J.P. Vinod join us, who is an expert in those matters. So I thought we might start with, why do you think that a lot of people um, bury their heads in the sand? Well, you know, I think part of the uh, issue truly is that, you know, nobody's really planning for the future. They think, you know, I'm healthy today, I'm either working or I just retired, and they're not really thinking about uh, what's going to happen to them in the future. Uh, I'm going to stay healthy. We talked a little bit earlier about mm -hmm. being able to, you know, lift things today that tomorrow we're not going to be able to. And I think, um, you know, people really th think really about today. And, and there's not a lot of planning for uh, their health care or their living needs in the future. Do you see um, a lot more conversation now? Or where, where, are, the, where are the biggest challenges, maybe, that you see? Well, I think, you know, we're, uh, when I look at some of the challenges now uh, is when we start to get into the holidays, we see uh, many individuals coming and saying, uh, you know, there's a crisis. My mom, my dad, uh, my uncle, my loved one, whatever it might be, uh, needs help. They um, have seen a decline. They came to see them during the holidays and maybe haven't seen them that much. Maybe they've been on the phone, uh, but... Being in person, you actually get to see some things that have happened, mm -hmm. and uh, you start that crisis mode. And unfortunately, being in a crisis mode is a struggle. Uh, and fortunately, I see that on a routine basis where individuals are looking for uh, different services because of something that they've just noticed that maybe has been creeping up for a while. Mm. How, how much do you think denial plays into it? Well, I think denial, you know, everyone uh, doesn't really like to see themselves. We talked a little bit about being in front of a mirror, and sometimes you don't really want to see what's in that mirror. <laughs> That's um, right. But denial plays a, a large part because when you look at uh, your mother, or your father, or your loved one, uh, you still try to remember how they used to be. And uh, you don't want to see what may be coming down the road. And uh, I think the not denial... Uh, plays a key factor in maybe being later in uh, making those uh, decisions that may actually help in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, but it still goes back to um, really if you don't plan, it's going to be very hard for you to move forward uh, at a time when you're in crisis. That's right. Well, planning in crisis never is a good time, right. is it? Right. right. Yeah. I mean, that's maybe when you get stuff done because you've been in denial so long. Right, exactly. That, yeah. So there's, probably, there's a lot of trends, I think, nowadays where it used to be, you know, somebody, somebody gets into a critical situation or whatever and they go to facility, but there's a lot of different trends now. Can right. you speak on that? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, if you look at just the population, uh, there's 10,000 individuals turning 65 every single day. Mm. Uh, it's been coined as a silver tsunami. And really that uh, is in regards to the baby boom generation. Uh, and 30% of that baby boom uh, generation actually does not have children. So uh, that planning becomes even more important in uh, making some decisions. But um, when we talk about the silver tsunami, when we talk about the baby boomers, we're seeing individuals live longer. And uh, because they're living longer, they're needing more services and different services. And the state of Connecticut has really taken an approach that uh, there's probably more individuals that need home care, need more homemaking, need many of the services in their house uh, versus in a f traditional facility. And uh, you're starting to see the reimbursement, you're starting to see individuals look at it as ways in which they can stay home longer. I mean, if I were to ask you, would you want to live in a skilled nursing facility, the, the simple answer I, I would think is no. That'd be an accurate statement. You want to stay home as long mm -hmm. as you can. Uh, and what's interesting is uh, regulations and um, many of the, the services, you're starting to see more services focusing about staying home, uh, being able to plug in services home. Uh, with that being said, if you're not planning for it, you're in that crisis mode. And how to find the services you need, it is complicated. It's not an easy, there's not a one answer fits all. 
uh, for every individual. So you're constantly looking at how do I plan for the future and how do I really make sure that the plan I have is still up to date when it might have been a year ago that you developed that plan. Uh, we spend a lot of time worrying about living wills, but nobody really plans about their future down the road. Um, you know, it's interesting, I'm on the, the Wallingford for Planning and Zoning Commission, and we have individuals that will come and, and have in-law apartments and say, I'm doing an in-law apartment for my mother and father. And it's interesting because many people are looking at it as, well, I can take care of them here in my house, but they don't really plan for the aging in place that may happen. That 70-year-old mother or father that you have, uh, there's a good likelihood they're going to live over 85. And uh, their frailty and their, their mobility may become issue. And when you're designing something, you need to really look at uh, is the bathroom set up uh, from a, a, an ADA perspective? Is the kitchen situated? When they start to need assistance or a walker or something of that nature, is it set up for them? And because the last thing you want to do is have an in-law apartment, as they call them, um, set up in a manner that uh, isn't conducive to somebody that is aged in place. Did, what's the perspective on... Um, do, do people typically sit, will set up their house or they'll have a contractor or somebody do that? And then um, is the ultimate outcome typically they then go into a facility down the road? Or I've never really heard anything about that. I think it's, it all comes down to support mechanisms, whether it's family support mechanisms, whether there's means to uh, bring in other services home or if they uh, progress to uh, a disease state that they may need to go to a facility, there's, there's different avenues, but it really comes down to a lot of different components. It's, it's not you come, you, you live at your home, you're gonna go to uh, an assisted living, you're gonna go to a skilled nursing facility. That doesn't necessarily uh, jive or work with every single individual. It really depends on a lot of different factors, uh, whether it be family dynamics, whether it be financial situation, or, or quite frankly, if they've really planned to uh, stay home as long as possible. Sure. What we're seeing uh, through our industry is individuals are moving to a lot of the assisted livings and the skilled nursing facilities uh, longer in their progression of their disease or frailty which essentially has uh, shorter lengths of stay in the facilities. Uh, the days of individuals going to a convalescent home or a skilled nursing facility for 10 years is non-existent because the individuals are able to stay home longer with the services being plugged in. Um, but again, it does come down to planning. If you plan accordingly, you have a better opportunity to stay home as long as you can. Right. And what, what I've seen, uh, tragically so, is um, folks that don't plan um, end up giving all their lifetime assets yes. to the facilities yeah. and because care is not cheap. Right. And that's the way it is. And right. the ads of that requirement, having that care, um, are great. Right. So you know, I think we really are doing a service for everybody, quite frankly, getting the issue out there because... Right. Burying your head in the sand is never the right answer. Right. Well, and to some extent, uh, they may not need skilled nursing as early as they think they do. There may be other opportunities or options out there uh, that they just don't know. And, and I think the struggle for a lot of individuals is you're not thinking about this until you have to. And unfortunately, right. when you have to, you're making decisions based on whatever information is in front of you and you haven't really done all your research. And unfortunately, we see that on a regular basis. So talk to me a little bit about the um, individuals that are providing care. Maybe what might their backgrounds be, you know, the different um, levels of skill, and then what maybe the demographics thereof are. You know, it's interesting because there's all different uh, levels of uh, skill from uh, doctors, uh, to individuals that are providing housekeeping, uh, meals, uh, um, helping in bathing or dressing as uh, CNAs, 
Uh, so there's really all different aspects. What's, what's interesting is what we do today is not what we're going to be able to do down the road. When I talked about the silver tsunami, 10,000 individuals are turning 65 every single day. There's actually more individuals over the age of 65 than 15 and wow. under, wow. Uh, which is going to cause some significant issues to our nation. It's going to cause significant issues to the state of Connecticut uh, for a whole host of different reasons. One, obviously, a workforce. Who's going to provide for those individuals that are 65, 85, 95, uh, and we're seeing individuals over 100 now, uh, where you know, there might be a few that were over 100 now, it's, it's almost a common. Um, and when we look at the other aspect of it is there's not enough individuals paying into the system, Medicare, Medicaid, to help pay for that reimbursement for those individuals that need care at uh, the 85 to 90-year-old. So there's, there's really some different dynamics that are, I, I think are going to continue to impact us and probably will continue to get worse. Uh, technology is an area where we have to make sure that we spend uh, a lot of time and energy because if we don't have the staff or we don't have the individuals, we're going to be relying on technology more so to help monitor, to help make sure that uh, those individuals that are home are taken care of and can be responded to in the case of emergency. So I think there's a lot of dynamics there uh, with regards to the, the ages. You know, we, we've spoken a little bit about denial and all of that, and I, in that I think um, individuals try and kind of cover up, you know, what their... Um, what the effects of aging are being. Maybe it's their memory, maybe it's their abilities to do something or whatever. So are there any um, telltale signs that you should be looking for in your mom and dad? You know, it's interesting. Uh, dementia uh, is probably one of the largest uh, issues hitting seniors uh, in this country. And, uh, you know, some of the telltale signs is, is really actually paying a little more attention to what's happening. One of the things with many individuals, we're all creatures of habit. You know, if you think about it, you get up probably around the same time, you, you go do your normal routine. It's no different than somebody at the age of 55, 65, 75, 85, 95. Um, but there's some good telltale signs of, uh, are they uh, not keeping up? with uh, their appearance? Are they not keeping up with the cleaning of uh, their house or apartment? Uh, are their finances? Are they not keeping up with their bills? Or, uh, things of that nature. Uh, a lot of times you don't realize it until it hits you in the face. And I think, you know, spending that extra time asking some questions or, or observing things that you might not have done before when your mother or your father or your loved one was, was in their 50s or in their 60s or 65, 70. Uh, it's really kind of staying a little extra vigilant on looking at some of those things because um, there are signs that start to progress. You start seeing it. Uh, but if you're not looking for them, you glaze right over them. Right. And they hope you do too. Right. Probably yeah. to a degree. Well, I, you know, the... There, there have been individuals and, and people think, you know, if I show a sign of weakness, you're going to put me away. Or right, right. I now have to admit that I'm failing or I'm not that individual that, um, you know, could lift 100, 200, 300 pounds. Now I need help. Mm. And that's, that's, a, that's a change because you're used to being independent. And now you have to recognize that, geez, I might need help. And, that, and that's a struggle. That is tough. Uh, your, your heart kind of bleeds for that to happen because you're not used to seeing that with your, your mother or your father or, or aunt, uncle, whoever it might be. And it's an uncomfortable situation. Yes. You know, and if they don't bring it up, uh, then you f might feel that you have to, and that's right. maybe, you know, out of your comfort zone, right. so to speak. Right. Um, I, I've seen it with, with my parents, quite frankly. My mom's 90 and my uh, father's 85 and you know they've slowed slowed down a little bit um, any um, any thing that you can tell the family about being proactive I mean you mentioned looking for certain signs are there any um, 
things that you can follow through on? I mean, maybe if they have 10 checking accounts, maybe you should hone it down to something less than that. Right. And that kind of thing. I think sometimes it's, it's, it's having that frank discussion with uh, your loved ones or, you know, if you have siblings. Um, AARP has a good resource. There's other organizations that have uh, a good resource. I, I work for an organization that has the ability to look at telltale signs of things that are happening. If there's things that you can do to help, uh, you know, I, it, it's really garnering that trust mm -hmm. to not be able to take over everything because you still want to try to keep as much independence as possible. Right. But help, and it doesn't feel threatened. I, I would probably tell you the biggest piece is not to come across as threatening to your loved one because mm -hmm. ultimately they feel like you're taking something away from them. Right, right. Which is easier said than done. You got that right. Yeah, so maybe we can talk a little bit about regulations and all that exciting kind of stuff. Those uh, are always fun to talk yeah, about. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, uh, I know, for instance, that if somebody's ho hospitalized, I believe they have to be there for a certain period of time and then go directly to a rehab facility, nursing home, whatever the case may be. Otherwise, they don't get benefits. Right. Um, can you expand upon that? Well, it's interesting. You know, the regulations across all gamuts of the industry of uh, senior health care uh, relies heavily on regulations along with reimbursement. And, um, you know, the hospitals have requirements of what they can do and how much care they can provide before they do discharge. Uh, and rehab facilities. Uh, have the ability to take on individuals if they meet certain requirements within uh, the regulations and within the reimbursement system. It's complex. Uh, that's where you rely a lot on your discharge planners. You rely a lot on the social workers to help through that process. Um, but the, the interesting part with the regulations is, to some extent, sometimes the regulations actually have not changed to the standard practice of what's happening anymore. And I'll use an example. The days of having a knee replaced uh, and having to go to rehab and then after rehab go uh, home for physical therapy uh, are almost non-existent. The majority of individuals actually do not go to rehab facilities when, if they have their knee done. They actually go directly home. So there's a lot of changes within uh, the reimbursement but also in the way care is delivered. The big thing you'll hear a lot about is uh, many of the quality indicators and along with um, the re rehospitalization rates. Um, and keeping those rehospitalization rates down help in the whole reimbursement system of that hospital or that facility. And you see a lot of that. So you're seeing a, a shift in where individuals actually will go that five years ago, 10 years ago, they may have actually been in that facility. Uh, and I think that's kind of the interesting thing with our industry and along with um, everybody wants to stay home. So mm -hmm. the reality sure. is you have that knee, you have that hip, you don't want to go to rehab. You want to actually go home as quickly as possible. And uh, their reimbursement system is, is different based on that. And I think that's also another key component to all of this. Um, but when we talk about the hospital discharge to a rehab facility, it's really in line with what the um, uh, regulatory requirements are that fall within the reimbursement. If they don't meet those requirements, there's a possibility that they actually may have to pay for it out of their pocket instead of through Medicare. Mm. Uh, and I think that's, that's, again, where you rely heavily on your discharge planners and your social workers to help you through that process. Okay. okay. So are there any, um, be, being that the majority of folks would want to stay home, are there benefits via either the state or the government, or the federal government, that will help them? Some of it, uh, yes, there is to some extent. Some of it is hinging on uh, pre-existing pre conditions uh, along with was there a hospital stay or a discharge from a hospital. Uh, or some of it does come down to your uh, whether or not you can financially afford it um, mm -hmm. through Medicare and Medicaid, um, more specifically Medicaid. Um, so there are different mechanisms in place. 
Uh, but I will tell you that our system is very fragmented. The uh, healthcare system in itself is very siloed, and so is the reimbursement system. Uh, and I think that is probably the areas where I would hope that our legislators and our industry could get together to really flatten the line out to provide the service across the board, which, quite frankly, should reduce the costs. Because if you really look at it, the last year of someone's life is probably the most expensive mm -hmm. that right. from a healthcare perspective. Is there ways we can flatten that down for a cheaper alternative, still provide the great quality care, still do the things that need to be done, but keep that cost more linearly than the spikes? And I think that's really where, as a healthcare industry and also within the state uh, and in federal government, struggle with that. Obamacare was a perfect example where, you know, I think there was a, 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 an attempt to try to make some changes, uh, but it still has many pit, pitfalls in it, and I think it will continue to work through those. Um, I, I could tell you from a provider perspective, from a personal perspective, there's things that you, you, we have to be looking at to make, I think, a smoother transition of all the pieces of healthcare. Mm. So um, maybe it would be good for the audience to hear about some of the numbers. Um, uh, I don't think they're going to make you smile. However, i.e., you know, what are the odds of this, or what is what are the costs thereof to to individuals? Well, you know, it's interesting um, when we talk about the cost. I mean, the cost to live in uh, facilities can range from an assisted living can range uh, from thirty nine thousand dollars all the way up to eighty thousand dollars a skilled nursing facility can range from ninety thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand um, having uh, somebody stay with you in your house may cost you uh, many thousands of dollars uh, so depending on where you are what services you need may depend on whether or not you're even paying privately versus paying or having it uh, reimbursed through uh, Medicare or Medicaid. Um, so there's many different facets along with, you know, think about how many times individuals have to go to the doctors and the <laughs> cost of that along right. with prescription drugs. That is one area where I would tell you, you know, it, it's become extremely costly. Prescription drugs uh, are very expensive individuals struggle with paying for that along with paying for their rent or paying for their uh, other care that they may need. So uh, it is a struggle. And when you work on one piece, there's so many other pieces that kind of cause that domino mm. to change. And how do you work through those dominoes it is, is a struggle, I, I will say, that nationally everyone is struggling with. I know the, uh, the, the states, I don't know if it's the number one line item, but if it's not, it's pretty darn close. Yeah, typically it's this and, and defense are really right. the two big ones. Right. Um, there are some reports that say that uh, really Medicare will surpass to spend, uh, defense spending uh, in the very near future. Uh, and that's because of our silver tsunami that is, is really has come we probably will not see as much of an impact yet until probably another 10 years, I would say. And that's when the baby boomers are starting to, mm -hmm. to hit this mid-70s. Uh, and I think that's really where you'll start seeing a, a little bit of a blip in um, the health care cost. So you mentioned um, private pay. And um, uh, certainly, I'm sure there's a lot of that. Of course, insurance, there are insurance policies. and. Uh, having been involved with that, I know um, they're not inexpensive. That's one of the primary complaints. And now there's asset-based uh, policies that seem to be a little more palatable. Are you seeing any kind of shifts there, or is it about the same? I would tell you it's about the same. There's a report I saw recently that showed long-term care insurance policies actually on the decline. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of that is cost. But, uh, you know, it's... When you look at it, it, it does come down to planning. Long-term care insurance is about planning. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people can't get over the cost 
And it goes back to our earlier discussion. If I don't need the care today, why am I paying all this money That's now? Right. And, right. and I, that, that, there's a mental block uh, for individuals on that. Um, and maybe there's another option down the road. I, I don't know what that is, but I do know that the, uh, in a recent meeting with uh, one of the larger providers for long-term care, uh, they are looking for other options out there because they themselves are seeing it. Um, we also have the other aspect of how do we keep the cost down? You know, mm. the, when we look at our healthcare industry, because it's siloed, it's really reimbursed that way along with the cost uh, is really associated with it. it is we need to really look at how do we get the cost down in a manner that I think everyone can, uh, one, afford, but two, if they can't afford, they're still getting the same care across the board. Mm. And, and I think nationally, we continue to struggle with that. Yeah. I uh, see we're running out of time, which is pretty amazing. It went by pretty uh, quickly, did, didn't it? Quicker than I thought. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, so I, I think we're going to be signing off. Uh, JP, I want to thank you a lot. Thank you. I, much thank appreciated. Thank you so much. And Very much uh, appreciated. folks, the one thing I want you to take away from this is that it's an issue you probably shouldn't hide from. Um, there are a number of, of avenues you can take, but doing nothing is not one of them that you, I would recommend, of course. Um, and uh, the states are going to be, I think, a little more exclusionary, if you will, because they don't have the money, and the feds too, I mean, not to take over, but um, I think that, um, you know, it's kind of like the Social Security issue. Okay, that's that's an aging issue, and this is an aging issue. Right. So, um, if you would, I w would encourage you to at least maybe think about it, just over the holidays or when you have a chance, and um, try and be a little more proactive than maybe you have been. And it, there's a cost not only in dollars, but emotions and physical costs to the caregivers too. Right. Okay, and a lot of times the caregivers are you. So with that, I'd like to thank you for watching the inaugural Community Conversations. Really appreciate it, and everybody have a great day.